stay hungry, stay foolish. Across the Western world, more and more people are slowing down. Slower is better, better work, better productivity, better food. Almost everyone complains about the hectic pace of their lives. These days, our culture teaches us that faster is better. But in the race to keep up, everything suffers. There has never been a better time to embrace the healing power of slow. We welcome author of In Praise of Slow, How a Worldwide Movement is Challenging the Cult of Speed. Carl Honoré, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. A couple of items jumped out to me. One was how you mentioned when you had the opportunity to do nothing, you found you had lost that skill. And two was how something caught your eye, one-minute bedtime stories for busy parents. Yeah, I suppose when we get stuck in fast-forward, it always takes a shock to the system or a wake up call to make us realize we've forgotten how to put the brakes on and that this is doing us real harm. And I think for a lot of people, the wake up call comes in the form of an illness. The body one day just says, no, cannot carry on anymore. And you have a burnout or can't get out of bed one morning. My wake up call came literally when I was reading bedtime stories to my son. And back in those days, I was almost physically incapable of slowing down. So I'd go into his room at the end of the day, sit on the bed with one foot on the floor and speed read Snow White. Yeah, so I'm skipping lines, paragraphs. I became an expert in what I call the multiple page turn technique. <laughs> Any parent out there will be wincing <laughs> in recognition. But of course, it never works, right? Because my son knew every story back to front, like every four-year-old. So we were always at loggerheads. He would say, you know, Daddy, why are there only three dwarves? <laughs> tonight? You know, what happened to Grumpy? And this really lamentable state of affairs went on for some time until I caught myself speed reading a newspaper article with time-saving tips for fast people like me to go even faster. And one tip talked about this book called The One Minute Bedtime Story. So Snow White in 60 seconds. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. I need that book now from Amazon, (laughs) drone delivery. But, But then thankfully I had a second reaction, which was completely different. I thought, whoa, has it really come to this? Am I really in such a hurry? I'm prepared to fob off my little boy with a sound bite at the end of the day instead of a story. And it was one of those moments of searing epiphany you know it was like an out-of-body experience you suddenly see yourself from from above and what i saw there was just ugly unedifying and totally wrong and i realized i'd i'd lost my mind lost my compass right and i needed to slow down that was the start for me of this whole journey towards reconnecting with my inner tortoise if you like yeah and this book's 16 years old now since publication so your son is a little bit older my my own two sons are 10 and 6 And it's one of the most magical times in my own day is that bedtime story. And it made me think when I was reading your book that the reason we work is to live, not to work. And often it's to provide for our families. And in this moment where we both have the time now to be a bit slower in this COVID crisis throughout the world, we can reconnect with our children and with slowness. I thought it's a great opportunity, but you tell us in the book that we all suffer from what's called time sickness. I think of it as a almost a it's a physical, spiritual, emotional, metaphysical addiction we have to to speed, which has infected really every corner of our lives. So that whether we're at the workplace, or we're in the gym, or we're cooking or eating in the family kitchen, or we're reading bedtime stories to our children, we turn every moment into a race against the clock or a dash to the finish line that we never ever seem to re- to to reach. And, and we do find ourselves then in this absurd, poisonous paradox that you touched on there, which is that we're, you know, you talk about working in order to live. We, we seem, seems to be the other way around, that we've not only if we put the work first, but the speed has become an end in itself. And if you think of how we use time, we've got that completely turned around on its head. You know, most, I mean, I don't think anybody arrives and looks back at the end of their life from their deathbed and thinks, I wish I'd spent more time on Instagram right? or more time at the office. And yet it's the office and social media that hoovers up all the vast majority of our time. And yet what really makes us happy, what makes us complete, what makes life worth living are those small, slow moments, the reading bedtime stories to your child, the strolling in the park 
as the sun sets with your partner, uh, the moment where you're just, you know, swinging in a hammock in the, on, on vacation and letting your mind wander. Th- those are the moments that give life texture, color, meaning. They're the moments you, you do remember on your deathbed. And yet what happens in this fast forward roadrunner culture, those moments get steamrollered <laughs> by all the other stuff because we're constantly trying just to accelerate everything, cram more and more into less and less time. And we end up in this downward spiral where everything becomes quantity faster and faster and quality, you know, connection, meaning, all that good stuff, stuff that makes worth life meaning just gets jettisoned. And again, you wrote this book almost 20 years ago before the iPhone, before Instagram, before those distractions have come on mainstream. And as you told me off air, you sensed it in the air that this was coming and you sensed there was a burgeoning need from humanity to reconnect with slowness. But one thing really struck me was when you said in the book, Americans fail to use up to one fifth of the vacation allocation and the average age of burnout is getting less and less. And you encapsulate all this idea of speed and the desire to work harder and work faster with the cautionary tale at the time again of Kamai Suji. Japan, of course, is in some ways the uh, has reached the kind of apotheosis state of workaholism, right? I mean, they have a word to describe the phenomenon of death from overwork, which is karoshi. And this this chap you're describing there was someone who had become a a superstar in the workplace for putting in brutally long hours and sleeping under his desk and doing all the things you feel you ought to do to get ahead in corporate life or to climb the slippery pole. And he for, for a time, he seemed to be winning it, right? He seemed to be winning. And then, of course, one day he died. <laughs> I think it was a heart attack that took him out. And, and it's just a cautionary tale, I think. It's a, it's a reminder that there is only so much productivity you can squeeze out of a human being. And there is only so much anyone can do without resting, recharging, and reflecting you know we all we all have limits and i think as a society we were doing it back when i published in praise of slow first in 2004 in some ways you could argue argue we're doing it more today that we are bumping up against the very limits of what the human mind the human body the human spirit can take and we're paying a price right i mean that burnout rates as high as they've ever been mental health problems i mean it's it's an epidemic of mental health illness of, of all ages. This isn't just an adult problem either. Of course, kids are suffering from a similar problem. Uh, and then you look at what's happening on a macro level, right? We're pushing up against the limits of what the planet can take when you think of what turbo consumerism and turbo capitalism is doing to mother nature. So we're really at the in the in the end game here for how much more speed we can squeeze into the system. It seems to me that we can't squeeze anymore without paying just, I mean, the, the, the ultimate price. So there's there's definitely a feeling, and I think this whole COVID nineteen moment could turn out to be a, an inflection point. You know, it, it forcing us to confront the folly and the peril of turning everything into a dash to the finish line. Right, that, that moving away from the culture of more is more and faster is better to a culture where less is more and, and slower is often better. And we'll see we'll see where it goes. But it's it's fascinating to me to see what's happening. This forced shutdown as people are obliged just to stay at home, to to do less, to move away from the the kind of superficial, fast, consumerist, shiny, plastic pleasures of early 21st century life, and to learn to appreciate again simple pleasures and slower rhythms. Yeah, and I really enjoyed when you talked about the history of speed, and you delved deeply into this in a whole chapter, this human desire to track the passage of time is baked into our mental architecture, you tell us. And the link to time and money changed everything when in 1748, Benjamin Franklin proclaimed, time is money. And this was around the time of Taylorism, where time was tracked and linked to money and linked to productivity. And this really changed a lot of things for everybody. It did. I mean, the the antecedents, of course, were pointing in that direction already. And that's one of the things I found most interesting in the research was discovering how Society, we, I think we associate this fast forward, always busy culture with today, but there has, I mean, they, like, you can find its roots going deep, deep back. And even as far back as, you know, ancient Rome, when they brought in sundials, that began to change people's relationship with time. Suddenly you could measure time, not, not as precisely as you can with a, an eye watch, right, or a, or a Swiss Rolex, but, but you could measure, you could parcel it up into chunks. And once mankind could dice up time, we began to speed up. We began, to, the clock began to take over. We became, 
in a sense, sk- slaves to schedule. So even in ancient Rome, you'd hear people complaining about how their lives were now dictated by by the sundial. You know, it's noon, I've got to be here for this lunch meeting, or, you know, it's sunset, I've got to be home, who knows, doing whatever people did in ancient Rome in the early evening, they weren't watching Netflix, <laughs> whatever the contemporaneous equivalent was. So, so that was already there. But then, of course, yes, as you say, once you get into the modern era, you hitch that neurotic relationship with time to the addictive money-making machine of modern capitalism and modern production and Taylorism and so on. And the thing just goes viral at that point. That The whole ethos of time is money tells you how do you get value for that time or your time? You go faster, right? Like you do in a factory. You produce more and more, squeeze more and more into less and less time. And it, that that approach, that paradigm, I guess, pushed in first through the Victorian factories, but then spilled out into daily life. So that people in every walk of life began thinking and worrying about how time was passing, how they were maybe not making enough of their time. And then you move into the kind of late 20th century, early 21st, where we are now with information technology and all these time trackers and things and the gadgets that allow us to do everything all the time, everywhere. And we've just, we've lost it, right? You know, that we've just blown away all of the the barriers, the buffers that kept us safe, that sometimes forced us to stop and slow down because wherever you are now, you can whip out your your smartphone and and be working or checking up on Facebook or reading the news or doing something, right? And, and so that just crowds out the space for simply being. We've become human doings instead of human beings. And one of the things you talked about time, which I thought was fascinating and to remind everyone listening, because we forget about this, particularly in the Western world, that time had been made linear in the Western world, but in Eastern traditions, time is cyclical. It's these kind of moments of recycling and rebirth and regeneration, just like the seasons throughout the year. Yeah, and there's something deeply, well, natural, e- eternal, and soothing about that image of time. Because as time flows away from you, it's also flowing back and renewing itself each day. Whereas with our linear Western idea, time, well, we have time's arrow, right? Flying remorselessly from A to B. Time is a a limited resource it's always draining away you know the you've you know the last minute we've lost you could think we've lost 60 seconds right and i think that feeds into the general neuroses we have the general kind of paranoia about wasting time and it's it's woven into our vernacular as well just think of the expressions we use to describe and to denigrate the very idea of of, of not you know, squeezing as much as you can out of time. We talk, you know, people say lunches for wimps, or we talk about downtime or dead time. I mean, these are all negative, pejorative, downbeat words to describe often important moments in human existence, which are when you just switch off, you stop doing, and you just simply be or rest or put your feet up or let your mind drift. And those things have all been made to seem weak, like a failure, like a waste of time. And uh, I think a lot of what drives it, this fast culture is this dysfunctional relationship we have with time itself. I think that's maybe the, the root cause or certainly one of them. You really did a great job looking at the history of this and how we got to where we are today. And this was driven into our mindsets, particularly in the 1800s. And, and industrialization and urbanization had a huge part to play. But what I found really interesting was how the ruling classes promoted punctuality as a virtue. And even schools started promoting and brainwashing children for punctuality and being late, being such a bad thing, etc., and drove this into the mentality of humanity. Yeah, I mean, that was very much the, a hallmark of that early and, and uh, early mid-industrial era was that it wasn't enough just to build factories and have people come. You, ha- you had to change the culture. And so the whole... Yeah, the powers that be and the people, all the vested interests that stood to gain from people being punctual, you know, particularly capital and getting people to on to work on time and so on, that, that just lined up to <laughs> behind this idea that punctuality was was a new virtue. I mean, pa- traditionally, patience is seen as a virtue, right? I mean, that tra- it, but but we we almost replaced patience with punctuality. It's now almost to be seen to be impatient is often held up as a virtue rather than patience and punctuality very much so a few a few years ago i think it was ecuador in south america had a a, punctu- a nation- nationwide punctuality drive and again it was tied up with this idea of it's ti- it's high time we embrace the modern world that we forged in the self help language a better version of ourselves a make a better ecuador and the way they did that was to give out watches and to 
you know, put a, put a, a big stress on people being on time and not being late for meetings and not being late for school and respecting other people's time and so on. And that was just a few years ago, right? So you can see the same phenomenon happening now, a century and a half after it was rammed down our throat in Europe and North America. You mentioned again in the 1980s how a New York-based Trends Research Institute noted a phenomenon they called at the time downshifting. And this is something we are witnessing more and more today. I mean, downshifting will have various definitions, but I suppose in some ways it just means, yeah, shifting down a gear, right? So you're probably, probably, this will vary from person, but probably it means a bit of, you know, working less, consuming less, rushing less, less of a carbon footprint, just less, right? Moving away from the more is more model to something more modest, but something at the same time, of course, more joyful. The people who downshift and get it right, uh, never go, never, no one ever upshifts having downshifted, right? In the same way as nobody has two burnouts. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, once you've really run out of road with through, through your fast forward life, you know, nobody, nobody goes back because there's so much to be gained by finding that tortoise mode, by slowing down, by getting the right balance. The timing of this couldn't be better because so many people are going to be stuck in slow now and they're going to have to reevaluate and from every crisis comes an opportunity but one of the things you talked about in slow was actually food and in the 19th century german philosopher ludwig feuerbach said we are what we eat but equally you say we are how we eat so you devote a whole chapter to food and turning the tables of speed on food and you say today most meals are simply refueling pit stops and that is so true some houses don't even have a kitchen table anymore some flats don't have kitchens and many houses now have kitchens that never get used right apart from the microwave you know everything is just uber eats or something on the hoof and yeah i mean it's that's i think one of the greatest losses i mean we lose many things when we get stuck in in turbo mode but the the the, the simple soaring human joy, the pleasure of the table that's been with us across all cultures, all times, all ages, right? I mean, even very late in life when some other pleasures maybe drift away, we usually still have the pleasure of breaking bread with people we love and eating good food. And, and if you drink alcohol, you're drinking good wine. It was the first chapter in the book. I, I started looking at all these different strands of the slow culture quake and asking how we could slow and how people were doing it in different walks of life. And I, I started with food because well, A, because it was already at that point an official slow food movement, but also because it seemed to me to be almost the cornerstone of slowness for people. It's so often the, the gateway drug, right? When people are, are caught going fast, doing everything, the first place they'll often slow down is, is with food. You know, they might start starting, I don't know, baking on the weekend or just taking time to sit around the table with their their family or their partner with the phones and the TV switched off. And and the, the joy of food is that no matter how jaded your palate is, no matter how far you have drifted away from real eating and moved into the kind of refueling, faster, processed food nightmare, you can you can taste with one morsel, you can taste how 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 beautiful food can be, right? If you take a slower approach. So it's often for a lot of people, because if people say, well, I'd love to slow down every aspect of my life, but where do I start? I often say food is a good place to start because you do get the payoff right away. If you say to someone, you know, there are sensible ways for you to slow down at work and that's going to pay handsome dividends. You know, they're, they, they bump up against other people's prejudice and disapproval, and maybe they don't notice the payoff right away. Food, you get it right away. You can just open your mouth and and put a delicious bit of home cooked food in and you think, yeah, I get this. I get this. You said the speed of food is reflected in our farms. And I was struck by something you said that two centuries ago, the average pig took five years to reach 130 pounds. Today, 220 pounds can be reached in six months before the pig even loses its baby teeth. And this fast agriculture is damaging our health, our planet, and indeed the biodiversity of the planet. Yeah, I mean, it's, of course, you talk about the joys of food and, and eating well and what that does at the table, but the planet pays a hefty price for industrial, especially high high speed industrial agriculture, where whether it's moving towards monocultures, you know, getting rid of diversity, destroying environments, destroying all of the small ecosystems, uh, bees, all the insects and things just to create these massive farms, or the, 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 the horrors of large scale industrial, you know, um, cattle, herd, um, livestock, that's the word I'm looking for, livestock raising 
I mean, it's just, you know, it's grotesque what we're doing to the natural environment. In fact, in, the, in recent years, the last couple of years, there's been a whole slew of expose documentaries and so on on Netflix and things looking at um, the horrors, the dark side of industrial agriculture. And, and you know, they've done very well. And, I, and it's interesting. People feel a very visceral reaction against these things, I mean, get what they see. You know, you, people who probably eat that kind of food find it really jarring and really shocking because I think we, we can feel in our bones that it's just not right. You know, and then when we do take the slower approach, we do have a bit of meat, say, that's been, you know, grass fed, and, you know, good quality meat, or we have a tomato that's actually in season and been pulled off a tree nearby or from a farm just outside town versus the tomato that comes, you know, vacuum packed from a country hundreds of miles away, right, and, and probably frozen for a little while. You know, we, 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 we appreciate it right away. And I, it's going to be hard to, it's to, to, reinvent the food sector they're talking about a super tanker turning around but you know even in the in the years since in praise of slow first came out there have been you know we've made huge strides i think towards rethinking how we do food um you know moving much more towards organic production people sticking as more and more people sticking more and more to the seasons uh, people eating much less meat especially processed um, industrialized meat so, you know, th- things are changing definitely on that front in, in, in big ways. We're recording here amidst the COVID-19 threat. And one thing that I was struck by was, I know COVID's a different beast, but 3,000 people are killed every day through speed in road traffic accidents. And that's besides the fact that so many people are psychologically maimed and physically maimed. People don't just happen to die. They may be paralyzed for life or they may be injured for life. And it's something that we don't pay that much attention to, again, because we're so preoccupied with speed and getting to where we need to be because we are uneasy with having time to ourselves. Yeah, it's a funny, it's a a chilling metaphor, what the the carnage on roads around the world, isn't it? That we we just look the other way at at the the just astonishing number of people whose lives are destroyed in one way or another every day and and why is that i mean it, it it must be that at some deep collective level we decided that it's a price worth paying to get from a to b a little faster and and that to me is just i mean it's hair raising isn't it and and when when you when you put numbers like that in front of people they feel their hair raising as well right so we haven't lost our humanity it's just i think collectively we just made so often we make decisions probably even subconsciously just to push away Part, you know, it's the same thing happens with climate change and, and what we're doing to the environment, right? The whole kind of pla- use of plastic. I think we've known at some intellectual level, we've known that it was wrong and unsustainable. But it's only just very recently that the kind of pushback against plastic has really, really gathered pace. But for many years, it was just, you know, plastic bags at supermarkets, people throwing, you know, getting bottled water everywhere, just unbelievable volumes of plastic. And then somehow, you know, maybe two, three years ago, or even maybe more recently, that dial shifted. So, you know, it, it, it's it's an interesting thing about the human animal, isn't it? That we, in in the interest of serving certain, servicing certain of our desires, in this case, speed, when it comes to cars, we're willing to put up with an awful lot of pain through the community, right? Without really doing much about it. And moving on to the, the mind itself, Carl, you again gave a whole chapter of this, I loved how you phrased this. You said, in the war against the cult of speed, the front line is in our heads. Changing what we think is just the beginning. We need to change how we think. And you explained everything from transcendental meditation to qigong, to walking, to super slow weightlifting, to explore how we can slow down the mind itself. Everything starts inside the head. You know, otherwise you're not really going to get very far. You have to change the chip in your in your brain you've got to change the mindset before everything else will fall into place and, and i'll unpack that in two ways the, f- the first is of course the, just the cultural change accepting that slowness has a role to play in the 21st century that patience is still a virtue that in fact in a world addicted to speed slowness is a superpower right so accepting that making that mindset change and then adjusting your behavior accordingly but then i think what you're tilting towards there in your question is also 
that there are different kinds of ways of thinking, right? Different modes of thought. And that was one of the things I found most fascinating in the, in the research is that in the same way as every aspect of the slow movement or slow revolution is about doing things at the right speed, understanding that there are times to be fast, there are times to be slow. It's about playing with different speeds, changing gears. The same thing goes on in the brain. There are times when you want to do the kind of Malcolm Gladwell blink, shoot from the hip, instinctive, you know, fraction of a second judgment call. That's crucial. That's an important thing sometimes, but not always, right? Sometimes you need to slow things down and reflect, let your mind wander and drift. And in fact, there's pretty good science that shows that when you're in a relaxed, unhurried, mellow state, the brain shifts into a richer, more nuanced, more creative mode of thought that psychologists actually call slow thinking, right? Um, and, And I think we all know that, right? I mean, if your listeners just pause for a second and think, you know, when do their best ideas come to them? The the number one answer to that question, you ask it anywhere in the world, the number one answer to the question, where do my best ideas come to me is always in the shower, right? Mm -hmm. Or, or walking the dog or hanging out on vacation. You know, no one ever says my best ideas come when I'm juggling 39 emails or racing to meet a deadline with a boss or a client breathing down my neck. They come in those slow moments. And I think that's, that's a, a useful corrective for society to have more of that rich, deep, reflective thinking. But it also is a good metaphor, I think, for just the whole question of what we do with fast and slow is not to throw fast out the window and make everything slow. That would be, you know, giving up the cult of speed for the cult of slow is not what this is about. It's about finding some kind of middle point where you, you, you choose your moments to be fast. You get the... You have your inner hair and your inner tortoise, right? And you shift back and forth between the two. And I think that's especially the case in our minds, which which is why, you know, the most forward-looking companies now around the world ensure that their staff have time to switch off, you know, whether they have quiet rooms where they can go do a bit of meditation or listen to whale music. <laughs> uh, just, you know, quiet spaces so that – because the science is, is incontrovertible that you need – to get away from the coal face. You need to get away from the distraction. You need quiet. You need slowness. And that's when the the deeper, richer, more, more creative thought happens. And so, you know, whether it's quiet rooms or, or in fact, that's something that's boomed since I first wrote in Praise is Slow is the whole mindfulness movement, right? I mean, people weren't even talking about that when I, I was taught, I, you know, it was meditation, it was called, but this, it's the same thing, right? It's the idea of being present and in the moment, emptying the mind, slowing things down, stepping outside time. These are all just different ways of saying, slow the heck down, people, right? This idea of taking a step back and creating a safe place or a a relaxed space to be more creative and innovative is core to the essence of this show, but also to childhood and to, to raising relaxed children. And this was something, again, you recognized back in 2004 that has become a huge problem with the over scheduled child, the over hurried child, and children actually suffering from stress and anxiety at a very, very young age. Yeah. In fact, I, I wrote in my second book was called Under Pressure, which is all about children and, and the things you're describing there. And it's, it's very true. You know, we've transmitted the virus of hurry to the next generation. You know, kids come out of the womb now and a lot of them hit the ground running, right? You know, it's baby Einstein, <laughs> baby sign language classes, baby goes pro sports clinics, Mandarin lessons in the Moses basket, and then these endlessly stuffed extracurricular schedules. You know, for a lot of kids now, it's childhood has come to resemble a race to perfection, right? It's and, and a game of all or nothing, right? It's you're, you're either this alpha child who's juggling a million things and getting the top marks in exams and running around all the time, or you're or you're a loser, right? You're a hoodie, heroin addiction, and homelessness, right? And, and it's just absurd because. Children, A, children are all very different. They're all unique. But B, children need slowness. They need it maybe more than adults do because it's in those moments of unstructured time, of not knowing what's coming next because there's no schedule. There's no adult there telling you what to do or how to do it faster. Moments even of boredom, right? You know, we are all so terrified of boredom nowadays. But throughout human history, when a child was bored and came to their parents and said, Mom, I'm bored, that was a child's problem right? Yeah. Your mom would say, well, go outside and play or, uh, f- you know, make go, you know, go find a friend or deal with it. Now a child comes to a parent and says, I'm bored. And the, it's the parent's problem. You think, oh no, my child's bored. I'm failing as a mother or father. But no, on the contrary, you, you need to back off, slow down and let the boredom happen. Because it's precisely in those moments of boredom that children are forced to 
turn in on their own internal devices. It's when they learn how to think, how to invent, how to use their imagination, right? That would be the phrase your mom would say. You're bored? Well, use your imagination. Uh, and, and that's how you do it, right? When you don't have the stimuli, you don't have the distraction, you don't have the schedule and the adults chivying you along. That's when children learn how to stand on their own two feet, get along with their peers, think, create, innovate, all the stuff we're constantly told we're supposed to be preparing the next, next generation to do. They learn it through boredom. They learn it through free play. They learn it through slowness. And yet what's happening around us? Well, for the most part, we're still stuck in this faster is better paradigm when it comes to raising children. I mean, I see a lot of changes. And since my book Under Pressure came out, you know, that was 2008, uh, you know, many school systems have made change, you know, the, and you see school parents, you know, a lot of things have happened. There's a whole slow parenting movement, slow education movement, many, many changes. But But the dominant thrust when it comes to child rearing, I think, still remains one of acceleration, busyness, and stimulation. Because, you know, every society ends up with a childhood that reflects that society's strengths, weaknesses, hang-ups, neuroses. And we've, you know, we're a fast-forward, overstimulated, over-caffeinated, over-busy society. And we end up with children who end up falling into the same <laughs> the same groove. Yeah. And you, you mentioned this, and, and this really struck home because Again, nobody's at fault here. I suppose people are conditioned to think they have to do this. You mentioned, for example, in in Praise of Slow, that one father was talking about his four-year-old son when he said, I need to get him used to a 10-hour day like me because that's the way you have to survive. And you said in the book, children are not born obsessed with speed and productivity. We make them that way. And I loved what you reminded us of and, and, he, and still is done today, which is great which is in Harvard, for example, the, the dean of Harvard releases a letter every year to the students called Slow Down, Getting More Out of Harvard by Doing Less. Well, exactly. This, this is one of the ironies, delicious ironies of the moment is that you know, many parents are plowing all this energy, time, money, expertise, bringing in the professionals to get their children into Harvard, right, or Oxford and so on. But what's happening at Harvard, Oxbridge, Ivy League schools, well, increasingly they're seeing kids coming through the front door who just cannot cope, who are falling apart, who haven't had the time and the space to work out who they are or how to stand on their own two feet or make their way in the world. And so they're they're picking up the pieces and they're now sending a different message down the the chain to parents and saying, look, you're, you know, don't try and force your children into this kind of whirlwind approach, you know, parenting should not be a cross between a competitive sport and product development, right? You know, it's something very different from that. And and so you've got Harvard, you've got, you know, um, Oxford sending this message saying, you know, you don't have to send, not every child has to come to the university interview with grade eight oboe and, you know, having opened a soup kitchen and having had A stars. And everything. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't have to be that way, right? You know, let your child find the thing that they're very good at, that they're that lights them up, and then let, let the other stuff go, right? You know, try everything, but don't feel you've got to do everything and keep it going up to the very end. You know, less again that phrase, less is more, and you hear it more and more from college university application people just saying, trying to s send that message to parents, just you know, just relax, you know, exhale. It's going to be okay, right? Give your children that time and that space and that freedom to. To work out who they are, right? To um, and to 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 develop, right? Because that's again the science is on the side of the angels here. It's on the side of slow. It's saying, back off, let things happen, let children play, and as they have throughout human history, they will evolve, they will develop, they will find their footing. Yeah, I love that man. And you know, one of the previous guests we had on the show was a guy called Alan Schwartz, and his book was called ADHD Nation. And what he was talking about was in the U.S. They have a huge problem with college students taking ADHD medication like Ritalin and Adderall purely to keep up. So they take it to do their work, to be able to do it because they're so over crammed with their schedules, etc. And then on the flip side, recently we had Dr. Daniel Amen on the show and his book is The End of Mental Illness. And he was talking about this unfortunate epidemic we're seeing where children are reporting with anxiety problems, with stress problems, et cetera, et cetera, and getting medication for that. So they're almost medicating themselves against the medication, which is just a total reversal of what the world should be. Oh, utterly. I mean, when a society gets to a point where it's medicating that large a chunk of 
the child population, something has gone seriously wrong. Right? <laughs> seriously wrong. I mean, that is the ultimate indictment of, 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 of a collective failure when we're doling out pills to kids in the numbers that we are and that kids or, or you know, late teens and early 20s feel they've got to pop pills in order to keep up or meet whatever standard they feel they've got to meet or just simply to get through the day. Uh, yeah, we, we are so far beyond <laughs> being in a good place now. And, you know, in some ways, I was going to say children of the canary in the coal mine, but in fact, they're probably, you know, the, the rest of us, the adult world had already got mired in this pharmaceutical mess before they did. And now we've just handed it on to the next generation, right? And we're just pushing it younger and younger. I mean, you've got parents now, you know, turning up with, with toddlers, you know, kids, one, two, and, and trying to get medication for them because they feel like they're not either rolling over fast enough or conforming or, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not some, you know, tree hugging hippie who never, you know, I, I believe that conventional medicine has a role to play. And in some instances, medication is going to be, you know, you know, really, really important for people at, at any age, but it should not be the default setting. It should not be the norm, <laughs> which is, we're very much in danger of it becoming for at all ages. I suppose we need to role model for our children. And we have this opportunity again with this slowdown, this mass global slowdown that's happening. And you say in our time is money culture, giving workers dominion over the clock goes against the grain. There's this kind of thing of um, unlimited vacation time, which doesn't in the wild doesn't necessarily always work out as as it sounds. But it's part of that same I like Virgin um, is, is one company that does that, where they don't have fixed vacation times. They sort of say this is the work we expect you to get done in the calendar year. You you arrange your time around it. You take the time that works. Um, you take the time off that you you feel is right for you to get the work done. And and that may not that's not going to work for every company. And and in some ways I think. For some of the things I read, it hasn't entirely worked out as expected in companies that have done it. But if it shows a new willingness, a new openness to the idea that the best work will be got from employees and staff when employees and staff have control over their own times, right? This is the, in all the surveys, when you look at what people find the most inimical to their productivity, their creativity in the workplace, it's it's feeling rushed. It's feeling not in control of their time. It's, it's that sort of stress of being out of control. They want autonomy. And, and you know, the technology will allow us to give it, give people that more and more, remote working. So I, I do think we're moving in some ways, you know, obviously there are examples where we're moving in the opposite direction. If you think of Amazon, what do they call them, fulfillment centers where people, you know, people's toilet breaks are timed. But, you know, the other parts of the economy, you know, more white collar work, you know, people are getting more freedom in lots of ways to choose when they switch off their phones, to work from home, to work, uh, you know, if they want to come at three in the morning, that's fine. And, and I think more and more we're going to move in that direction as the workplace changes and an understanding of how you get the most out of knowledge workers and people who have to build networks and use social skills and all that. All that stuff comes down to time timing, being present, being slow, right? So there's, you know, it's, again, it's a tectonic shift. It's going to take time, but I think more and more we're seeing examples of that, that rethinking, um, you know, the four day week, big hot topic at the moment. Um, countries talking about, you know, New Zealand talking about doing it. A lot of companies individually embracing shorter working hours. Of course, France had its experiment, which with the four day work, well, the, the 35 hour work week, which has turned out to not have been as successful as, one would have hoped, I think, largely because it was a dirigiste. Uh, my view is that it was a top-down thing; it was too rigid. But the, you know, the spirit was was right. The idea that you can often get more done in less time if you give, you know, if you if you arrange your days and your weeks more sensibly, but you also give people control over their time. So I think I think that's where we're going to go: is you know, um, moving away from this rigid Victorian early industrialization idea of the clock clocking in, clocking out. Right? That's such a you know the the uh, Charlie Chaplin film Modern Times and the the slave of the clock that we, we've 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 inherited so much of that we're we're marinated in it but but it's it doesn't work in the modern world it just doesn't work for the kind of work we do nowadays so change is coming and and, and it will come I think more and more that's a lovely way to finish Carl and where can people find out more about you your talks your books etc well, that's easy I'm at my website carlhonore.com and there's lots of stuff about my books there's video there audio, blogging, and there's also a lot of links to other groups that are doing things in the world of slow. So if, it's a good jumping off point if you want to 
find out more about that particular side of what I do. Author of In Praise of Slow, How a Worldwide Movement is Challenging the Cult of Speed, Carl Honoré, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Been a pleasure.